speed. Okay. Here, I can see. Okay. Okay. Well, let's get started. started. <laughs> um, I apologize for the late notice, but hopefully you saw my message that what we're going to do today is work through a Water Gems demo, solving the same problem that we previously have done using Excel. Does everybody have a paper copy of the solution? Okay, so we're going to do that in just a moment. Um, as a reminder, phase one of your project should be submitted on Monday. So by 1 p.m. on Monday, phase one, uh, that should include the summary page and it should include your supporting calculations. And basically, uh, help me to understand where those numbers came from. And it, it shouldn't just be calculations, it should be like headers on the calculations, like these are the calculations res relating to residential demand. And then if you've done some outside research, then you're identifying your resources as well. So you could uh, have a reference list, you could print out the reference that you found, anything to make it as easy as possible for me to understand what your numbers are based on, what were your assumptions, and how did you perform your calculations. So that's due by 1 o'clock on Monday. If you have questions, I'm going to be uh, checking my email over the weekend, so feel free to send me a message and I'll do my best to reply. Um, also on the schedule for Monday, if you look at the calendar for the semester, it shows that we have our second uh, quiz of the semester on Monday. And so the uh, coverage there is just going to be the material since the last midterm exam. And so, um, that'll most likely be a question related to open channel flow since that's really what we've been addressing since the midterm exam. Then looking a little bit further into the future, homework 8 which includes the material uh, with Manning's equation and some non-uniform flow topics that will be introduced uh, today and next week uh, that's due on Friday. So a week from today is the next homework due date. Any questions related to the announcements? Yes. So here's the summary chart. Um, so residential demand, let's just assume that the tourism is accounted for here in the hotel in the east zone. So any sort of tourism, what's your town by the way? Reno. Reno? Okay. Yeah, let's assume that whatever uh, tourist demands they're going to have is built into the hotel and that the residential demands would be unaffected by that. Are you talking now specifically about the hotel? So um, in the, um, the handout I gave you where you're assigned different factors, I think I said how many rooms the hotel has. Is that right? So assume that um, in this worst case scenario day that the hotel is full, that it's got 100% occupancy, and that also happens to be this day that it's the hottest day of the year, and there's a fire in a residential area and everything else is happening simultaneously. So I wanted to point out here on the summary table that the design condition for residential is the highest of peak hour or peak day plus fire. So this cell would be the fire flow plus the peak day. So the bigger of these two is what's going to be added to the peak hour of the commercial demand. Now there's no fire uh, requirements associated with the commercial demand, so you just find the peak hour and then the design flow is going to be the sum of the peak hour for the commercial and the larger of the two residential demand options. And then the design flow rate per outlet is the design flow divided by two because there's two interior locations where water is being uh, delivered inside the north zone. Same thing with the south zone. There's two arrows. If you look at the map, there's two arrows that are pointing in to the south zone. So this residential demand, the bigger of the peak hour or the peak day plus fire is going to be the design flow and then the design flow per outlet is the design flow divided by two. Okay. <clears throat> so I've handed out 
this spreadsheet and it goes back to the Hardy Cross method which you learned uh, several weeks ago where we're trying to find out the flow rate through each pipe and the pressure at each junction and the given information that we had was the pipe length the pipe diameters how much water is coming out at E how much water is coming out at B where it's coming into the network and we had a control point at A that gave us uh, the given pressure at A and so from that information what we were able to do is solve until we converged and we saw that the flow rate was no longer being corrected in each iteration the F values were stabilized and so those were the two indicators of convergence and so we had a flow rate through each pipe and then calculated the pressure at each junction so at the bottom of the page you can see that what I did is I indicated the flow direction the flow rate and then this pressure at each of the locations was based on the flow rate through the pipe so I knew the flow rate through a B was 581 liters per second 0.581 cubic meters per second so in pipe a B I calculated the head loss through that pipe using the Darcy Wiesbach equation so here's the head loss formula it's the R value times the flow rate squared and so the loss through AB was 3.49 meters of head and if I assume that all of these junctions are at the same elevation then the pressure at B is just going to be the pressure at A minus the difference between A and B so it was a pressure decrease and so you'll see that I've got a table at, of all of these pressures and so just as a refamiliarization of how to use water gems because that's what you're doing in phase two of your project is you're going to take the demands that you've just estimated in the project and you're going to start designing a pipe network that satisfies those demands so you'll take this information of how much flow is going out at each of the interior north zone junctions how much flow is going to the hotel how much flow is going to the food processing plant and so on you're going to have your design flow rates and you're going to be sizing the network so just as a refamiliarization of how to use water gems we're going to solve uh, this same example that I've just handed out on paper uh, and see if we get the same flow rates hopefully we do otherwise we're in trouble so if you're following along start up water gems and we're going to sketch a conceptual network using these layout tools that are in the home ribbon and we're going to put in the uh, the data that we know for the network we're going to put in the pipe diameters that were given at the beginning the pipe lengths um, the roughness was defined in this original problem it said that the roughness was 0.3 millimeters and so that's the roughness that corresponds to cast iron pipe so we're going to assume that material and we'll put in the flow rates basically everything you can see we're starting from a blank screen we're going to do it from scratch and find the flow rates and the pressures and compare them any questions before we begin okay so on the layout click the layout button bring the cursor down into the drawing window and let's just click on the screen that's saying J1 now we're gonna rename it A later on but I'm gonna click over here that's my location B down here is C D F E E connects to C and now I have to press the escape button and then starting at junction 5 which is F click back up to junction A I'm going to escape again now what I have to do to represent the flow coming in to the network because that was one of the givens in the problem statement is uh, the flow rate in at A was given as one cubic meter per second and the flow is coming in at D the way that you tell this program water is coming in somewhere is you connect it to a reservoir that's one of the ways that's how we're going to do it and so here in the layout button bring the cursor back down and right click and we're gonna change it from a junction 
to a reservoir. And so just put the reservoir nearby and then right click, change it back to junction because we don't want it to change junction one into another reservoir. We'll just connect it by specifying that. So then escape. And we have to put in another reservoir. So right click, reservoir, this one is another place that the flow is coming in and right click junction alright and escape so this is just a schematic representation of our network what you're gonna do is you're gonna actually draw a scaled network on top of an image and um, when you do you won't have to do the user defined lengths like we're going to in this example but um, Hopefully, we were in SI units. Let's just double check. Tools, more, options, and uh, units, SI. If you weren't in SI units, unfortunately, you're going to have to throw this all out and start over. Draw your sketch, your schematic sketch, um, after you've switched it to SI units. But hopefully, you already are. The other thing I want to do right at the beginning is I want to make sure that it's going to use the Darcy-Wiesbach equation for calculations because by default it uses uh, Hayes and Williams which is less accurate so here in the options for the base calculation options menu double click on that and change the friction method from Hayes and Williams to Darcy-Wiesbach I forgot to do that earlier this morning and my values weren't right. Like I was solving the network, but it wasn't giving me the flow rates and the pressure values that I was expecting to see. And the reason why is I'd set the wrong energy loss method. So the way that you get to that again, it's home, options, under the steady state menu, there's the base calculation options and double click on that. And then in the drop down box, toggle it from Hayes and Williams to Darcy Wiesbach. All right, so we've got the units specified, the friction method specified, we've drawn the network. Now let's just rename the junctions and so it matches more of what we knew, the junction names. And the easiest way to do that is open up the flex table for the junctions. So with the little triangle underneath flex tables is where you can do that. And so J1, I'm gonna rename that to A. Okay, J2, that is B on the map. J3 is what I was calling C in the previous example. J4 is D. J5 was junction F. And finally, J6 was junction E. All right. Now you'll notice that none of these locations have an elevation. Now in the example we worked before, it was they were all at the same elevation. So zero is fine for me to leave as the elevation. But in your project, the elevations won't be zero. The junctions are going to be related to the contours that are on your map. So wherever you put your junctions in the network, you're going to have to look to see what's the ground elevation there. And then my suggestion is bury your pipe a meter below the ground. And so the elevation that you put in would be the ground elevation minus one meter so that you've got good cover on top of the water pipes. Uh, one other thing we can do in this menu since we're here is tell the simulation where the water's coming out. Like where are the actual demands. And so from the given information we know that there's a demand at B and a demand at E. So 0.6 cubic meter per second and 1.6 cubic meter per second. So here in water gems, the way you do that is in the demand collection field. And usually what yellow means is that you can't edit that field. So it's a little bit weird that they make you put in the flow demands that way. But here in the demand collection for E, click and you'll find this dot 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 box click on that 
and then the demand for junction E is 1600 because the units at the top say liters per second. Okay, now I'll do the same thing at junction B. Demand collection is 600 liters per second. Now I don't have to tell it how much to take from the tanks. It's going to know how much is needed from the tanks because of the outflows that I'm taking from the network. So it's not like I have to tell it at junction A there's one cubic meter per second coming in. That'll be a result of the hydraulic con uh, calculations it does. Any questions so far? For the reservoirs, we, we don't do anything with the reservoirs for the demand. The, the only way that we specify demand in the network is at the junction level. So you go into the junction flex table, and it's under demand collection. And so we have a demand collection for B, and we have a demand collection for E, but we haven't done anything else related to flow rate. All right. Um, Okay, let's put in the reservoir elevation because the reservoir elevation is how we tell it how much pressure is at the control points. And um, what we had is that the pressure at A is 600 kilopascals. That was one of the givens that we had. And another given is if we look at conditions at D, we need to have the head at D in order for the model to know how much energy there is where the water's coming in. And so I'm going to give the, uh, the reservoir elevation at junction A is this head value, which is related to the given pressure. And I'm going to also tell it how much head there is at junction D, because that's another place that the flow comes in. And so in the reservoir flex table, I'll fill in the elevation field. So reservoir 1 is this one that's connected to A, and that has the elevation of 61.162. And then the elevation of reservoir 2 is 57.83. Okay. So now our network is pressurized, but the pipes aren't yet the correct size and length. So the final thing that we have to do before we execute the simulation is we have to make the pipe characteristics accurate. So if you open up the flex table for the pipes, we could relabel the pipes if we wanted to, you know, A, B, B, C, that sort of thing. But we'll just look at the start and the stop node as the indication. So in the handout I've given you, uh, there's a sketch that says what is the diameter and the length of each pipe. So pipe AB, for example, um, just to make it simpler, my suggestion is let's put, uh, so click has user defined length because we're not going to use the scaled length. So click the yes box for that. And you'll notice that when you do, for has user defined length. Now the length field opens up so it's editable. And if it isn't already, drag the diameter and the length columns so that they're next to each other. It'll just make it easier to type things in. So you can click at the top of a column and reorder where it shows. So drag the length column so that it's just to the left of the diameter column. That'll make data entry a little bit simpler for you. All right, so AB, for instance. So pipe AB has a length of 220 meters, and the diameter was 500 millimeters. BC, from our sketch, said 100 meters is the length, and the diameter of that pipe was 650. CD was 80 meters in length and 850 in diameter. DF was 200 in length 
with a diameter of 500. EF80, diameter 700 millimeters. EC150, and 600. FA, length 180, diameter 400. Now what about these other two pipes? The pipe that connects the reservoir to junction A and the other reservoir to junction D. Those pipes don't really exist in the real world. They just they exist only virtually. It's, we can't put a reservoir in the same place that we want to have the junction where we're measuring pressure. So you'll notice that uh, they have a length of zero. We may get an error message if the length is zero. So just put in like 10 meters. Make it short because what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and minimize the energy loss through these pipes. Since they don't exist, there won't be any energy loss at those pipes. So we have to make them short and a really big diameter. So 1,500 millimeters will be enough that there's effectively no energy loss. You won't have to do this virtual pipe thing in your design project. All of the pipes will actually be real pipes, but this is just how we are ensuring that we have a certain amount of pressure at A and a certain amount of pressure at junction D. Okay, you'll notice that the material says ductile iron we need to change that to cast iron. And so you can do that with the drop-down box, material libraries. If we go to cast iron, you see that the roughness height that it has programmed in the material library for cast iron is 0 .0003 meters. So that's 0.3 millimeters, which is the same uh, epsilon value that was given in this example we worked with Excel. So select and you'll notice it said cast iron. Well, that's kind of tedious to do that one by one by one for all of them. So what you can do is at the top of the list, if you right click, global edit, we can set and then type in cast iron. Oh. OK. So it'll automatically assign that material property to all of them now. Any questions or problems so far? All right. We could execute the model, but before we do, let's put some annotations on the screen. The annotations make it easy to see what's going on with the network because then you don't have to open up the flex table or the element properties to see what's the pressure or what's the flow rate. So let's annotate the pressure at each junction and the flow rate through each pipe. And the way that we can do that is over here on this element symbology menu, if you click the plus sign that's to the left of where it says pipe, for example, you see that we could turn off the pipe label. That's not useful information, P1, P2. That's not telling us anything. So let's turn off that pipe label. But then right click on the word pipe and new annotation and then um, in the field name, drag down to where you get to flow. So what it's going to do is it's going to write what's the flow rate on the screen. And the percent %u will give the units. And if I put a prefix on there like q equals, then that'll show up in the annotation as well. Um, just to make sure that those annotations go above the line and not on top of the line, let's do a vertical offset of three meters. So now if you click apply, you can see it's saying not applicable because it hasn't yet calculated, but Q equals is the prefix. The percent U is the units, which will be liters per second. So it's going to tell us the flow rate through each pipe. Okay, so OK. The other thing we want to annotate is the junction pressures. And so click on the plus next to the junction. It's already got the labels, and we want to keep those. But right click on the word junction, new annotation, and let's add from the freeform drop down box, select 
pressure. And then the prefix that we'll give it is P equals. And um, let's see, we don't want it to be right on top of that junction, so let's do um, an X offset of 3 and a Y offset. I mean, there's, there's nothing that's going to make it perfect. We'll do minus 3. Apply. So it's mostly out of the way. So it's going to give us the pressure at each of those junctions. All right, so as soon as I click that green arrow, as long as we don't have any critical errors, it's going to fill in the blank with the pressures and with the flow rates. So let's do that. All right, so now the moment of truth. We compare what Water Gems did to the Excel solution that we would solved. So for instance, in the Excel solution, it told us that uh, this pipe AB has a flow rate of 581, and the direction was from A towards B. So 590 versus 581. It's pretty close. What about the pressure? Um, the pressure at junction B should be 565.8. So 564. Again, pretty close. Um, the difference might be, I wonder how much head loss we're getting through these little imaginary pipes that we created. But if you look at the rest, for example, the, uh, the flow rate for pipe uh, DF389, so 389, so it matches there. The flow rate for um, EF was 808, 792 for CE, 808, 792. So the pressure at junction E, uh, 548 kilopascals, and Excel said that the pressure at junction E was 549, so it's off by just a single kilopascal. So I think we've got success. It worked. So that's just uh, an illustration of how you can use water gems. Now in the project, what you're going to be doing is optimizing. So right now, these pipes are bigger than they need to be. Our rule in the project is that during this design condition, your pressure can never go below 240 kilopascals. So we're way above that. What it means is that we spent too much money on big pipes. We could have saved our client money by making the pipes a little bit smaller. So for example, what happens if I, what's the biggest pipe that I've got? Um, if we look at the uh, given data, I think the biggest pipe we have is CD. It's 850 millimeters. What if I made that pipe a little bit smaller than it is right now? So what if I go here into the pipe table I'm going to make pipe CD, here it is, instead of 850 millimeters, would it be okay to use a 700 millimeter pipe? So as soon as I press enter, I can recalculate with this compute button. And then I look around my map. Is there any place the pressure got too low? I mean, it hardly had any effect, honestly. The pressure at junction E is still 546, whereas previously it was 549. So changing that pipe diameter didn't have a negative consequence. And so now iteration is going to be just keep pushing the boundaries of how much smaller of a pipe can you get and avoid going below 240 kilopascals. And so if I open up my pipe uh, table and I say, well, what if I make Let's see, what's the next biggest pipe so far? Let's say this pipe, oh, we already did CD. Let's try changing pipe EF. That's a pretty long one. So pipe EF. What if I go from 700 to a 100 millimeter pipe? That's a huge change. If you think about cross-sectional area is diameter squared. You know, it's related to diameter squared. So I'm changing to a 100 millimeter pipe. Click Compute. Everything still looks good. I don't see any pressures that are below 240 kilopascals. So I just saved my client thousands of dollars with that one change. 
And so you could go through that process over and over again, keep ratcheting down these pipe diameters. And you're not looking for the single diameter. It doesn't have to be the same diameter for every pipe in the network. That would actually be uh, suboptimal because there are certain pipes that are going to carry more flow by virtue of the demands at the location that they're going to. So some pipes need to be bigger than others. But in this case, we still have a lot of optimization because we're nowhere near that lower limit of 240 kilopascals. The upper limit in your project is 850. So you should never have more than 850 kilopascals. And that occurs when there's no demand. And so let's find out in, our, in this design, if I set all of the demands to zero, so I go into the junctions, and you remember the demand was specified in this demand collection. So let me switch off the demand by deleting that. So there's no demand at B, and there's no demand at E, and then I compute again. So this is now telling me the static pressure. So the static pressure is what's going to be the, uh, the pressure in the network when there's no water coming out. So there's no head losses anywhere. The pressure just depends on the water in these reservoirs. So the static pressure, it's not above 850. So I could move this reservoir higher up on the hill and pressurize my network more. And if I did that, if I make this reservoir taller, then that's going to allow me to make the pipe sizes smaller. Because putting the reservoir on the hill is what's giving energy to your network. So that's kind of a uh, a preview of what you're going to be doing in the next phase, phase two. So you're going to be taking the flow rates you generate during demand estimation, building a network, and then um, optimizing the pipe sizes. Any questions before we move on? Okay. Well, let's talk about water flowing through rivers. Um, it's possible to physically measure the velocity in a river. Um, the simplest way to do that is to throw a stick in the water and see how long it takes to flow a certain distance downstream. So if you're being really crude about it, you don't even have a measuring tape. You're just pacing. One, two, three, four. So you, know, you go 50 yards, you have your buddy upstream, throw in the stick, and then with a stopwatch you find uh, how long it takes for the stick to get down to where you are. So then you've got meters per second flow velocity. But that's the flow velocity at the surface. And the flow velocity underwater is going to be different. And so if you want to characterize the flow velocity underwater, you'd have to stick some sort of a probe underwater, whether it's like related to a piezometer, or whether you can see here is an impeller that's going to be spinning, and they've calibrated the rate that this little impeller will spin to a velocity that it reads out on the screen at the top. Uh, but there are also equations that we have that can estimate the velocity as a function of the depth. And uh, one of those here, the von Karman equation, is very complicated. It uses a logarithmic function of the depth related to the, uh, the distance from the bottom of the channel. And so depending on the slope of the channel, they find that there is a different profile for a steeper slope. So the von Karman equation says that if you have a really steep slope and the water is traveling down that steep slope, the velocity is going to have a, a more extreme profile. There's going to be a much bigger difference between the velocity at the surface compared to the average velocity. But uh, there are simpler equations as well. It's been estimated, for example, that if you know the velocity at a depth of four-tenths of the way from the bottom, then that's pretty close to the average velocity. Some people say what you should do is you should measure the velocity at two-tenths of the way up and eight-tenths of the way up and average those two, and then that gives you the average velocity. So these are just some of the ways that have been used to come up with the average velocity from a measured velocity at an exact depth or vice versa. If you know the average velocity using, for example, Q divided by the area, then that gives you the average velocity. If you know the average, then you could find the velocity at a certain depth. So these are just estimations that have been developed for that. 
Um, we've talked about n values and how that's the Manning's roughness coefficient. That tells you how much resistance there's going to be for different materials. And a high n value means it's a rough material and the flow rate is going to decrease. Um, whereas if it's a smooth surface, that would give you a low n value. But a channel is going to have a whole variety of different n values. It might be in a floodplain, for instance, that uh, in the floodplain there would be a certain amount of um, surface that is really rough, like st um, stumps of trees, cars, buildings, weeds, and so the water wouldn't flow very fast over the floodplain because of all the debris, but in the main channel it might be that it's really smooth. It could be concrete lined or it could be um, riprap concrete, whatever it is, it's going to have a different n value. And so the question is, how do you come up with an overall weighted average of that roughness factor? And one of the commonly employed techniques for that, called the Horton-Einstein method, says that you come up with not an area weighted average, but a weighted average that's based on the wetted perimeter. And so the idea is that you'd add up all of the lengths of the wetted perimeter. And remember, the wetted perimeter is where the water is in contact with the surface. And so here, the side slope would be part of the wetted perimeter, the floodplain distance, and now the side slope of the main channel's trapezoid, the bottom of the main channel, and so on. So you'd add up the total wetted perimeter, and then you'd multiply each of those elements' respective n values by the perimeter of that element. So it's the sum of the perimeters, and then the weighting factor, they're saying to the 3 halves power, and then you take the 2 thirds at the end. It's just a way to come up with a weighted average for the end value of the channel. It may come up in the future when we have a channel that's made out of more than one thing. Okay, so this is Manning's equation, and we've sometimes combined the areas together in the numerator to come up with the area to the 5 thirds power. The question is, what if we have several different uh, channels? Like, if we have a certain area that's going to stay the same, and a certain end value that's not changing, so the material's the same for all these different channels, and the slope is all the same, just looking at the equation, how do you get a big Q if, if these multiple channels have to have the same A, the same slope, and the same N? So the only other parameter that isn't on this list is the wetted perimeter. So the way that you'd have a big Q is to aim for a small p. So if you minimize the wetted perimeter of a channel, then you're going to maximize its flow capacity. So now look at these four different channels. All of them have an area of 20 meters. You could have one that's really narrow and deep, and this just seems kind of ridiculous, right? 10 meters deep but 2 meters wide, that would be really hard to excavate, a 10 meter deep channel. Uh, what about a channel that's 2 meters deep and 10 meters wide? A lot easier for construction, but is it hydraulically efficient? That's what we're going to look at. You know, which of these channels is going to give you the biggest flow rate? So uh, what we can do is we can look at for an n value of 0.013 and for a slope of 0 0.01, meaning a 1% slope, what would be the flow rate for each of these four different channels? So um, I'm going to just pop open Excel real quick and let's solve Manning's equation for each of these examples. Starting with a blank workbook and I'll paste in this image just to have it available as a reference. All right, so we will have B the bottom width, and that's going to be in meters. And we'll have the depth in meters, the cross-sectional area in meters squared, the wetted perimeter in meters, uh, the hydraulic radius in meters, and then we'll calculate the flow rate in cubic meters per second using Manning's equation. All right, so 
the first channel has a bottom width of 2, the next channel has a bottom width of 10, then a bottom width of 5, a bottom width of 4, Okay, the depth was 10, 2, 4, and 5. Okay, so the area of each of these is going to be the depth times the width. So they all have the same cross-sectional area of 20 meters, but the wetted perimeters is going to be different. For a rectangular channel, the wetted perimeter is the bottom width plus 2 times the depth. So it's 10 on this side, plus 2, plus another 10. So the perimeter that's in contact with water is 22 meters for that first section. And we can calculate it for all the others as well. The definition of hydraulic radius is area divided by the wetted perimeter. That is hydraulic radius. And now Manning's equation. Let me type this in, and we're doing this for a slope of 0 0.01 and an end value of 0 0.013. The R is the area divided by the wetted perimeter. Okay, so flow rate. It is going to be equals area to the power of 5 thirds times the slope. I need to anchor that reference to the slope because I'm going to be dragging these down. So I'll press the F4 button to put in the dollar signs. Slope to the 0.5 power divided by the n value. And again, anchoring that reference multiplied by the wetted perimeter to the power of 0.6667. So that's just Manning's equation. It's going to tell me the flow rate for each of these channels. So the first channel can carry 144 cubic meters per second. If you're laying it out on a 1% slope and you have 0.013, which is the end value for concrete. So that's how much water you could get through the channel. This? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try to figure out what value it's selected. All right, so it's going to be the, um, the area to the 5 thirds power okay. times the slope to the 1 half power divided by the n value times the wetted perimeter to the 2 thirds power. So what you should get is 144 cubic meters per second. Now, look, uh, this first section is obviously ridiculous. It's got so much wetted perimeter, there's going to be a lot of resistance. So you won't be able to get as much flow through there as you could for some of these other channels. So for example, if I drag this down, you'll notice that the channel that was 4 meters deep and 5 meters wide can accommodate 205 cubic meters per second. And the reason why is that there's more area, more flow area that's far away from these locations where resistance is applied. In the case of this tall, narrow channel, you're always under the influence of the wetted perimeter. You're never very far away from some surface where the velocity of flow is zero. But in the case of this 4 by 5 channel, there's this middle section that's pretty far away from the influence of the shear stress that's being applied by the material. Okay, so that's just an illustration of the principle that there's something known as the most efficient cross section. Um, in a trapezoid, we can have the most efficient cross section. It's, it's defined. There's a table that's based on the depth of flow, the side slope, 
for a best trapezoidal channel is root 3 divided by 3 for the side slope. And it corresponds to the channel that's most closely mirroring a half circle. The half circle shape is the most efficient hydraulically because you're maximizing the flow area and minimizing the wetted perimeter. So all of these other shapes are the shapes that most closely will fit um, a half circle inside of them. So the most efficient trapezoid, we know the area, wetted perimeter, and the width as a function of the depth, and all these other shapes as well. And so here's the most efficient, for example, triangular section is the one that you're going to be able to fit a, a half circle in. And so it has a 90 degree angle at the bottom. Um, I think we probably don't have the time to work this example, but this would just be solving Manning's equation for the depth. And so um, maybe we'll pick up this particular example when we start class on Monday. But between now and then, you've got some work to do on your flow estimation. So uh, as you work on that, let me know if you've got any questions, and I will see you in class on Monday.